Well, greetings once again, my friends. I'd like to welcome you to another uh, video. And as per usual, this video is going to introduce you to a nice collector item that's related to Star Trek. Uh, this is the original series, the motion picture, the second motion picture to come out. This was Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. And I present to you the hand phaser. This is from Diamond Select. I recently did a, a video on the Star Trek III hand phaser. Um, you can look that one up if you'd like. This one is similar to that one in the fact that it's a Type 1 and a Type 2 hand phaser. This is from Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. And one of the scenes that I remember most with this, with this weapon is, do you remember the not an earwig, but the creature that Khan had put into Mr. Chekhov to control his mind. Um, the creature would go in through the air, wrap itself around the cerebral cortex, and then they were susceptible to mind control. Anyway, when it came out of Commander Chekhov, Captain, uh, excuse me, yeah, Captain Kirk. No, I'm sorry, he was still Admiral Kirk. Admiral Kirk shot him with this. He shot the little creature as it came out of Mr. Chekhov's ear. So this is from Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. Of course, a lot of people think that that's when the Star Trek movie series actually got back on track. Um, a lot of people, I guess, did not care for Star Trek The Motion Picture. Um, I'm not saying that for myself because I, for one, love Star Trek The Motion Picture. My favorite character, for those of you that watch my videos, is, you know, the Enterprise, <laughs> the NCC-1701. That's my favorite ship. Um, and I consider the one from the original series and the refit the same ship, because they are. It's just refit. Um, I actually love the video shots of Star Trek The Motion Picture when it showed the Enterprise, because it would just showed how beautiful she is, showing off all the aztec and just amazing. Um, so that was my opinion, and I guess a lot of people didn't care for the storyline. Even the actors. Um, Leonard Nimoy said that the focus was too much on the ship. But I, for one, love the ship, so I like the movie. Anyway, I'm going to stop rambling. Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan kind of picks up where Star Trek The Motion Picture leaves off. At the end of Star Trek The Motion Picture, you know, Voyager and is gone. Ilea and Decker kind of merge and go with it. So now they got the Enterprise and she's kind of being updated and she's got a crew of uh, trainees aboard. So they're going to, you know, show her, well, show her new crew, the Enterprise, the workings, and all the making of the ship. So that being said, Admiral Kirk has a son. His name is David. And the mother is Dr. Carol Marcus. Well, Carol Marcus and David are scientists, and they're working on a project called Genesis. Now, what they want Genesis to be is the creation of life. Totally, literally, the word and the meaning of Genesis. They're talking about taking a moon or a dead form, launching the Genesis device, and it changes the matrix of the material that it comes in contact with, so it makes it living. That could obviously be seen as a weapon, because when you change the matrix, you change whatever it is that you're using the Genesis device on, whether it's an asteroid or a moon. And it changes everything, whether it destroys it or just changes the molecular structure 
either way, whatever was there is gone forever. Now, the Klingons had caught wind of this device, and they had won it. They had bought it off the black market. Commander Kruge is the one that's in command of the Klingon uh, bird of prey, and he purchases from a freighter the uh, Genesis information. What ends up happening is the um, Admiral Kirk doesn't know what Genesis is, well, right off the bat at the opening of the movie. His wife, well, excuse me, it's not his wife, but Dr. Marcus is informed that Starfleet has plans for the Genesis device, but that's only because Khan Nuneeng Singh and his people had captured the USS Reliant, and it was under its control. Seti Alpha, Seti Alpha 6 was the planet that they were going to, and that's the one that they thought they had found, when in fact they had found Seti Alpha 5 instead. Now, if you remember, the original series was the introduction of Khan Nuneeng Singh and his people. They were genetic, genetic, genetically excuse me, engineered um, superhumans. But they were responsible for a lot of destruction and chaos. And as a punishment, they were put into stasis and sent into space. And they were found later on the Botany Bay. Now, I don't know if the Botany Bay was supposed to be a prison ship, because they were put into stasis and there was no one there to uh, run the controls. And it was sent off into space. Anyway, the USS Enterprise comes in contact with this ship. So, of course, they board it. They take it in tow and they find these people. To make a long story short, they bring them out of stasis and the chaos that they had made in their century, they try to do the same thing in the present day with the Enterprise. Khan takes over, tries to take over the crew, but he does not succeed. So, Captain Kirk sends him to a planet, SETI Alpha 5, because he wants him to have the opportunity to conquer the world instead of going to prison or whatever punishment he would face. So he agrees, and that's the last we hear from Khan. Now in Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, the space station, the laboratory where Dr. Marcus is working, um, gets taken over by Khan. Now, Khan originally gets command of the USS Reliant because the Reliant is looking for a planet to launch Genesis on, to test it out. And the planetoid unit has to be completely devoid of life as to not destroy it. So when they go to City Alpha 5, okay, I'm sorry, they're, they're thinking they're going to City Alpha 6 to look for a planet. And that's when Commander Chekhov sees a life form, and he's like, oh, does it have to be completely lifeless? They end up going down to investigate, and that's when they come in contact. Now, Chekhov finds, they find a structure, and him and Terrell go into the structure. They take off their masks, and Chekhov is looking around, and he sees a belt buckle from a, with a belt that says SS Botany Bay, and he starts you know, thinking. He's like, Botany Bay. Botany Bay. And then all of a sudden his face just changes expression and he goes, Botany Bay! Oh no, we gotta get out of here! And he realizes that that's Khan uh, Nuneeng Singh who was on the Botany Bay. Now he did remember that they were supermen, genetically enhanced, so they would have had no problem surviving. Um, so, when they try to leave the ship to get beamed up, that's when they're confronted with Khan and his men. They bring him in, and Khan reveals himself. He explains how SETI Alpha 6, the planet they thought they were going to, had exploded. The orbital shift um, of SETI Alpha 5 ended up um, being shifted, and as a result, everything on the planet was laid waste. It was destroyed because everything became a desert. So Khan and his people were still alive, and they were using the remains of the Botany Bay as shelter. So, Khan then introduces 
the gentleman to the only remaining life form that was on SETI Alpha 5. And this was a type of creature that kind of looks like an earwig. It's got the, the pincers. I'll put up pictures to show you because I know I'm rambling and it helps with uh, <laughs> my explanation. Anyway, its offspring, when they're born, they go in and they find an ear and they wrap themselves around the cerebral cortex. Um, this makes the person very susceptible to suggestion. So with them under Khan's control, they go back to the ship. Khan ultimately gains control of the USS Reliant and learns about Genesis, and that's why they're on their way to the space station. So that being said, when Admiral Kirk is informed, he gets a message from Dr. Marcus, who's upset about them taking Genesis. So she thinks that the order was given by him because Chekhov said the order comes from Admiral James T. Kirk. So, now she's upset. She calls and she contacts Admiral Kirk, and they're going to the space station. They get there. It had already been ransacked from Khan. They're not sure where to go. And what ends up happening is the Reliant, under the control of Khan, moves in and they surprise attack the Enterprise. So in some of the most spectacular um, fight scenes in the Star Trek movies, you see the Reliant surprise attack the Enterprise. Um, Admiral Kirk, they're just coming towards the Enterprise. And Kirk is, you know, he's suspicious. He knows it shouldn't be that way, so he goes to yellow alert. But by then, it's too late because the Reliant raises her shields, locks weapons, and by the time Mr. Spock tells him what the Reliant is doing, they fired on the Enterprise. Ultimately, Genesis um, is taken and it's on the USS Reliant. Once the Reliant and Khan are defeated, he puts down the auto-destruct, the countdown, and Genesis ultimately explodes, destroying the Reliant, the crew, but in its destruction, it creates a new planet. That planet would go on to be the burial pl place for Mr. Spock, and that planet would play a big role in the next feature film, Star Trek III, The Search for Spock. Again, I'm sorry for rambling. Um, there was a lot of information to give to you, and I'm not the best narrator. <laughs> so I want to present to you The Phaser. The Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan Phaser from Diamond Select. This box is similar to the one that I showed you with the Star Trek III. It's got the clear area where you can see, but this one does not have the Try Me, whereas the other one did. You can see it's got a beautiful depiction of the Enterprise, the refit, our beloved ship. It's got Admiral Kirk on the front. Um, the side just basically says 2-in-1 design, Type 1 mini hand phaser separates from the Type 2 phaser. And this is collector number 35309391951. The other side, Diamond Select, and it's got the Delta logo. And on the back, it shows you other items that Diamond Select offers. Let's see, what do I have? I don't have the role play. Um, I do have the Enterprise D. That'll be a coming, an upcoming video. And on the back, it shows the phaser as a Type 1, and the phaser as a Type 2. And it's got some information. It is removable Type 1 hand phaser. Separates from Type 2 phaser. It separates, the pistol separates, and has unique sound effects. It is lighted as well. Multiple phaser settings include heat, stun, kill, disintegrate, and overload. I do believe that the Star Trek III phaser had the similar settings. In 1965, Gene Roddenberry approached NBC with a show he described as a wagon train to the stars. What he accomplished was the beginning and beyond, even for his dreams. The phenomenon, spanning 40 years as of this, Five long-running series and ten feature films, the fictional voyages of the USS Enterprise may have spanned the galaxy, but Roddenberry's idea moved the entire world. Throughout their advantages and adventures, 
The phaser served the Enterprise captain and crew as their only defense in its vast unknown. The phaser made its first appearance in Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan and also appeared in the sequel Star Trek III The Search for Spock. But remember, The Search for Spock, it was a totally different model than this one. While modifications were made over the course of the films and many copies we use for background action, this model recreates the prop in every detail, from the authentic sounds and light effects to the never-before-seen detachable Type 1 phaser. So, okay, that being said, let's go ahead and we'll take it out of the box. Open it up. It's got the plastic insert. So, let me put it there for you. It does come with uh, paperwork. Let's see if I can get it to stand up for you. I can't get it to stand up, so what I'll do is I'll put it here for you so you can see it. And let me show you guys what else it comes with. Oh, there was an extra battery in it. I got this off of eBay, and it was already opened. It comes with a brochure, and it shows you the classic phaser. And that's also the Type 1 and Type 2. I did do a video on the hand phaser, if you want to check that out on my channel. And it's got different items. That's pretty cool. The Borg. Check off. It's got the... It looks like a Mugaru. Yep, it's a Mugaru. Some Klingons. Other things you can purchase. Um, the characters. I'm not really into the characters. Mostly with me, I like the ships. Um, and this is the Type 2, Type 1 hand phaser that I'm showing you right now, and the communicator. I also did a video on the communicator if you want to check that out. So that's the brochure it comes with, and as far as the information, let me show you the uh, information sheet that it comes with. And as usual, don't worry, I'm going to put up a lot of pictures for you guys. You can pause it, you can check it out. Shows you the battery situation, um, how it works, how to remove it, and that kind of stuff. All that information for you. So, let me show you the, the unit itself. It's got the speaker underneath in the front. It's got the push button hand phaser. And see the controls. And, let me show you guys what it does. Oh, I might have taken the batteries out. <laughs> Hang on a minute, I'm going to put okay, batteries sorry out. about that. Actually, I didn't take the batteries out. It doesn't work until you put it on. And the setting on top, you push the button, and that activates it. You can see the buttons, different things. So this will... Oh, actually, let me set it to something. You can see we're set it to phase one. Let's see, stun. Set it to type 2. Actually, the first one was probably heat. This one is type 2. This one will be stun. So let's stun you guys. Now we'll set it to kill. If you remember, the little creature coming out of Chekhov's Air. It's a good thing Admiral Kirk was a good shot because he shot that right near Chekhov's head. Anyway, let's shoot the creature right now. As you can see, the lights increase in intensity. And the last setting would be for the destruct. So, you can see the difference in the firing, the strength. So, let me show you guys what it looks like when it's a Type 1 taken off. When you just, when you take it apart, it makes the, uh, the sound. Alright, let's try to remove it. You 
can see the speaker section. When you take it off, um, take the Type 1 off, it automatically turns the power off. This is from 2009, shows on the bottom, and you can see that there's no electronics in the, the Type 2. So we got the Type 1, it's got the three watch batteries, the small ones. You got the speaker, and now you've got the Type 1 hand phaser. So now these buttons. Alright, which way do I aim it? Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I had it aimed the wrong way. So now... Again, with the settings, it gets stronger. You get a little bit stronger in settings. Fire. And the intensity goes up. Finally, when you get to the totally disintegrate, and I think that would be the destruct or the overload. And the buttons do the same thing. super strength. I like that one. And when you want to reattach it, you can see where the pins lock into place. And it goes, and it's like a magnet that actually holds it into place. And it makes the sound effect, which is pretty cool when you de uh, detach. Of course, the power is going to be on. And then when you detach it, And then you put it back on, and you get those pretty cool sound effects. And once you take it off and put it back on, it depowers it, it shuts it off. So in order to do it, you push the button, and you fire. Oh, nope. Actually, you push the button, and you put the settings. Let's set it to... Let's set it to kill. It's too bad it didn't do like when it's a Type 1 with the uh, the cool effects the way the lights move. Oh, there we go. Okay, so that's that's the setting where you know you're in trouble. <laughs> so the top lights up also. You can see it blinks. Pretty cool. Pretty awesome movie prop. And this will go with it really, really well with a with a costume you have, the Admiral Kirk's costume. And I really like the way it's um, get that rainbow effect. Just like Star Trek The Motion Picture, the model from AMT, all the rainbow effect decals, but I really like that, uh, the way it looks. So my friends, this is the Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan hand phaser from Diamond Select that also can turn into a hand one, uh, excuse me, a type one hand phaser. And, let's see, fire. I got it the wrong way. See, I would have just killed myself. <laughs> or at least stunned. Nice. Then you put it back. Wonderful. So, my friends, I hope you enjoyed this video. And I don't really do the weapons a lot. I have done, I did this, I did the phaser from Star Trek III, The Search for Spock, and I had done the hand phaser from the original series. Of course, all diamonds select. Um, they are fun to play with. Uh, excuse me. They're fun to come out, take them out of the package, inspect them, and see if they work, if they function properly. <laughs> But who am I kidding? These are really fun to play with. And if you wanted to get one, or you wanted to see what it did, I hope this video satisfied your curiosity. And it's pretty cool. I don't know if these are that hard to get. 
Um, but I don't see these come up on eBay very often, um, especially the Star Trek III. I really haven't uh, seen many of those. But this is the Star Trek II version. And I hope you enjoyed my video. And I look forward to seeing you guys soon with another really cool Star Trek collectible. Until then, live long and prosper.